So hello, Dr. Cutcliffe, you are the co-founder and CEO of Pendulum. So welcome to Modern Health Span, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So Dr. Cutcliffe, could you provide like an introduction to yourself and what led you to form Pendulum? Absolutely. Well, first of all, you can call me Colleen, uh, <laughs> but my um, my background is in basic science research. So I do have a doctorate. I got my PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from Johns Hopkins. I did a pretty traditional postdoc at Northwestern, um, and then I moved out to the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, mm-hmm. um, where I worked in a pharma company. We were developing drugs for Parkinson's disease. Um, and then I did what everybody does in Silicon Valley. I joined a startup company, uh, mm-hmm. and this company was a DNA sequencing instrument company. We went through rapid growth. The company went public. And on the other side of that IPO, I started Pendulum. Um, this was a little over 10 years ago now. And the whole premise was really things like probiotics and yogurt have been on the shelves for decades. And um, microbiome science, which is sort of born out of DNA sequencing technologies, enabled us to really get out of the kind of small number of probiotics that we know about and into this huge world of the microbiome and start to understand what are all these different microbes? How do they interact with each other? How do they interact with us? And are there new targets for interventions that we can start to go after and bring kind of next generation probiotics to the world targeting different disease and health? Excellent. Thank you. Acomantia is one of the main, well, it's kind of a new one. And uh, it's it's one of the ones that you are the only provider of a probiotic for. So could you provide a little background on Acomantia, a little bit of its history and, and kind of why is it important? Sure. Um, Acromancia is probably the most important gut microbe that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> so um, acromancy was just discovered in 2004. So if you haven't heard about it, uh, that's maybe not surprising. It's a relatively new addition to our knowledge base. Um, but the reason why uh, it's be- becoming such an important um, piece of information is a few things. The first is that a healthy person, about 1% to 3% of their microbiome is made up with acromancia. So it is actually a really substantial part of a healthy gut microbiome. The second thing is really got to do with its function. So acromancia um, is the only strain that we know of right now that lives in the gut lining and is there to um, really keep that gut lining regulated. And so kind of just to give a little bit of a, a double click into the gut lining. Um, I always think of it sort of like a fence. I, I have a wooden fence in my backyard. Uh, it has these wooden planks that are held together by glue. When I first moved into the house, it was a brand new fence. Uh, every plank was really sturdy and strong and the glue was strong. But over time and through weather and wear and tear, the glue between those planks can start to weaken and a plank can start to fall. And that is literally what your gut lining is like. You have these cells, which are the planks, and they're held together by glue, which is called mucin. And as you age, these that glue can start to, uh, and through wear and tear and stress and things like that, that glue can start to get old. And these, again, these cells, some, similar to the planks, can start to have holes in them. And that's a really bad situation when you have this gut permeability because because all the things that are happening inside the gut microbiome can now leak out into the bloodstream. And that sort of wreaks havoc on your inflammatory system, your immune system, all sorts of different things that are not intended to be impacted by what's on the inside of the gut. And so acromancia, its role is it sits at that gut lining and all day and all night, all it does is take off the old glue and put on new glue. It is responsible for regulating the mucin layer that is the cornerstone of a healthy gut lining and good gut health. And that's why it's so abundant in a healthy person. And when you're depleted or missing acromancia, it's associated with a wide variety of diseases, not only kind of your common GI issues and digestion, but also things like obesity and metabolic syndrome, and even neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's. And so it's just a really important keystone strain in our gut microbiome. So you you mentioned keystone strain. So when you say keystone, what, what does that mean in this context? Yeah, I mean, I wish I could say I came up with that phrase, but I didn't. (laughs) It's uh, kind of what scientists and physicians are starting to call it. And I think what it really means is that um, it is a like a a um, outsized unlock in terms of gut health, and so it's not like any other strain where if you're depleted, you know, you're kind of just depleted at one thing. When you're depleted in acromancia, because you now no longer have kind of this fortified mucin layer, it leads to all these cascading problems that are much larger than just oh, this strain is missing. And so because of that, scientists and clinicians are starting to call acromancia a keystone strain. 
right? Because it, it works with the other strains. Okay, so so one of the things it does is it supports the mucin. But well, so it actually eats the mucin, right? Which is kind of counterintuitive that this is helping your gut lining, but but that's what it does, right? Uh, it, it actually uh, has been shown to do both. So it oh. can, it does feed off of mucin. So it can um, strip away. And I, that's why I kind of think of it like glue, like mm -hmm. before you, or maybe you could think about it like paint before you go paint your room, you first strip away the old paint and then you put on the fresh paint or before you go repair your fence, you first strip down the old glue and then you put new glue in. And so in this same sense, it is turning over old mucin and aged mucin, um, but it also has the ability to create mucin. And that's where the black box starts mm -hmm. to be a little bit uh, mm. unclear, which is under what circumstances is it performing these different roles and, you know, how are they actually regulated? And, and that's really uh, stuff that's just being discovered now. Right. So it's actually creating the mucin or it's stimulating your cells to create the mucin or do we know that? <laughs> I think that's what's being discovered now is, you know, what is the role that it plays in stimulating mucin production? But what's really known is that if you don't have acromancia, you kind of have both of these problems, which is that you don't have the uh, consumption of the old mucin, and then you also don't have this regeneration of new mucin. Right. Okay. So acromancia also has some other benefits, I believe, like, uh, I mean, it, it, because it's helping with glucose control. Right is is one of the things it does, which I think is through um, GLP one. So, could you talk a little bit about how it helps with uh, as a GLP one agonist? Sure. Yes, GLP one, which has become a very popular uh, molecule lately. <laughs> so, actually, maybe yeah, if you could explain GLP one first, that would be very helpful. Absolutely. Um, so it has become a very popular uh, um, small molecule lately. And, and the reason is because it is set, plays such an important role in not only our metabolism, but also in our, um, our cravings for food. So what happens every time you eat a meal, every meal has some degree of sugar in it. When you eat that meal, it's metabolized by your gut microbiome, and that stimulates your gut to produce GLP-1. There are these L cells in the gut, they produce GLP-1. And the reason GLP-1 is so powerful is because it does two things. The first thing is that it stimulates insulin secretion. So it's really important that we eat glucose and that glucose make its way into our bloodstream because that's how glucose gets to all the different organs in our body that all require glucose for them to be able to function and have energy. But you don't want that glucose to be hanging out in your bloodstream because actually having lots of glucose in your bloodstream becomes detrimental and starts to uh, really um, create problems for all of your different organs. So the body is tightly regulated in that you eat stuff that has sugar in it. GLP-1 is stimulated by the gut microbiome. Insulin is stimulated by GLP-1, and that makes sure that it can clear the, the, the glucose out of the bloodstream. But there's a second role of GLP-1 that's not entirely understood, and that is that it can somehow increase satiety. It can tell your brain that you've had enough food and you don't need any more. And so as a result of helping people to metabolize their glucose better and reducing their hunger, people are experiencing extreme weight loss when they go onto these GLP-1 drugs. And so what acromancia does is it is the gut microbe that's, it was, this was published in Nature a couple of years ago, um, where these scientists found that acromancia is one of the key gut microbes that it's the only one that's been shown to be able to stimulate GLP-1 upon consumption of food. And so it, again, becomes this really important central strain to our fundamental metabolism of sugars. Acromantia also is involved in the process of creating butyrate from fiber, but, but that is a separate thing, right, from the other the things that we've talked about so far. Uh, no, no, it's actually, it's exactly part of it. So if we want to double click into, well, how does acromancia stimulate yeah. GLP-1 production? It is through this pathway. So um, when we eat uh, um, fibers, they are metabolized into short chain fatty acids. Acromancia um, actually uh, can only metabolize uh, the short, can only create the short chain fatty acids, acetate and propionate, but those are actually upstream molecules that can be converted into butyrate. So acromancia doesn't produce butyrate on its own, but it produces the upstream molecules that get converted into butyrate. So it works with other strains to convert those into butyrate. And then butyrate is an incredibly important small molecule for a lot of different reasons. But one of the most important reasons is because it binds to these G protein coupled receptors, and that's what stimulates the GLP-1 release. 
There's a couple other molecules that acromancy is also producing that are known to stimulate GLP-1. This was actually very recently discovered. There's a protein called P9 that acromancy secretes, and P9 um, binds to receptors in the L cells that also uh, can stimulate GLP-1 release. And so acromancy appears to be stimulating GLP-1 through a few different things that it does. Um, but butyrate is one of the primary ways in which GLP-1 can be stimulated. Um, but butyrate is also a really important small molecule because all the cells in your body use glucose as a form of energy, except for your colon cells. Your colon cells use butyrate as their form of energy. And so butyrate has been used for a long time to help people with their with GI issues and with colon issues. In fact, a lot of people have been using it for um, to help prevent colon cancer because it really is this really important molecule and energy source for your colon cells. So the path to create the butyrate comes from Acomantia, then through these these other um, species. Uh, are there species that will create it directly, or does it always have to go through Acomantia? No, it doesn't always have to go through Acromantia. Right. There are definitely strains that can produce butyrate directly. One of them is called Clostridium butyricum, and its name, uh, as it implies, right. it is a butyrate producer on its own.